race, power, and justice. These are common flaws of the American dream. The Burial, a 2023 drama based on actual life events, centers on these three themes and how two racially and socially different people bring down a multi-dollar corporation. The film starts with Willie Gary, an affluent African-American lawyer, giving a speech at the black church on what is home. He highlights issues of racial profiling and how the church provides a safe space for the black community. The scene transitions to Jeremiah O'Keefe's birthday, an owner of a family funeral home in Mississippi. O'Keefe is on the verge of losing his eight homes, which pushes him to strike a one-sided deal with Lowen Group, a multi-dollar corporation, a decision that will turn his life upside down, threaten his business, but merge his world with Gary. We see Gary doing what he does best in the court of law, winning cases. He has a way with words. He addresses the jury in a humorous, rhetorical way that makes them and those in the courtroom side with the plaintiff, ending in applause. An obvious win, O'Keefe in the middle could not help but clap as well. O'Keefe is present in the courtroom after convincing from his junior counsel, Hal Dawkins. After the case, they both meet Gary in his office to persuade him to take their case. Through a flashback, we learn that O'Keefe has issues with insurance regulatory and has massive debts. His lawyer, Mike Allred, tries to convince him to sell a part of the business to salvage the rest and keep the family legacy. Convinced, they meet Raymond Lowen, the owner and CEO of Lowen Group, where they agree on a contract selling three of the funeral homes with the condition that the corporation will not sell burial insurance in southern Mississippi. Four months later, Lowen does not reach out to finalize the contract. Hal Dawkins explains to O'Keefe and Allred Lowen's supposed grand plan. He delays the contract because he senses O'Keefe's desperation. Why would he settle for three funeral homes while he can wait until O'Keefe declares bankruptcy, allowing him to acquire the eight homes at a lesser price and with no attached conditions? Upon this revelation, O'Keefe decided to file a civil claim. Dawkins pulls on Tommy's porch at weird late hours with a tape of Gary's biography. Gary comes from a humble background. He lives luxuriously and has not lost a case in 12 years, it sounds more like an American dream. In protest, O'Keefe does not think he is good enough for a contract law, but Dawkins convinces him he is the best based on race. Hal Dawkins thinks they stand a chance with a black lawyer in Black Hines County compared to a white one who appears to be full of himself. The county has a 3 to 1 black-white ratio, with a 70% chance of a black judge and a likely black jury. Although O'Keefe objects that Black Hines is not a discriminatory city and all red stands a chance, he is willing to attend Gary's court case. The film cuts back to the present time inside Gary's office. Gary is unwilling to take the case because it is a contract law case and not a personal injury one, their typical case. Second, he thinks six million dollars is too little for his firm. Third, O'Keefe is white and has never taken a white case before. They leave the office disappointed. Unconvinced, Dawkins goes back to the office. He brings them on board by reminding them that they do not have a significant impact on the elite legal community despite their success. Also, the Lowen Group is among the major corporations in the USA, and they stand a chance to have more than $6 million. Seeing the potential, they fly to Mississippi and take over the case. Gary's speech in Allred's conference room is humorous. He likens the case to war and demonstrates it with claps and foot kicks. We experience the first tension when Allred and Gary clash with ideas and who will take the lead counsel position. The tension is resolved, and Gary wipes out the idea of settling with a bizarre suggestion that the Lowen Group should settle them with $100 million. The Lowen Group recognized the nature of the race ratio in Black Hines and decided to counter it by hiring a black female African attorney with a fantastic record. The following scenes are a series of court proceedings that make the lows and highs in the film through mistakes from both sides. The first mistake is Gary's decision to cross-examine O'Keefe early in the proceeding to make the case enjoyable for the jury. His perception is to prove O'Keefe's character and values by referring to his heroism and opposition to the KKK. The action makes the jury take their side until the defendants cross-examine him and bring his character into question by referring to his wrong decision of deals and loans that got him into the financial fix. Gary is replaced as lead attorney, and the case does not look promising. Things become worse when Allred is put on cross-examination, and he turns out to be a descendant of a KKK member. This fact repulses Gary's team, and they bail out on him. Determined to salvage the case, Allred steps down and returns the lead to Gary. With their chances shaky, O'Keefe apologizes to his wife, who was against filing a lawsuit and intends to count his losses and withdraw the case. However, Gary has traveled back to Florida, and given the rapport they have built, he prefers to tell him in person. Simultaneously, when O'Keefe travels to Florida, Dawkins finds a lead on a contract between the Lowen Group and the Black Church. He calls Gary and tells him not to allow O'Keefe to withdraw the case. Gary and Dawkins visit the Black Church, and they gather enough evidence to show that the Lowen system targets the vulnerable community and makes a profit out of them. 
The leader of the black church takes them into a green field and explains that it is a cemetery. The cemetery holds slaves who did not have enough to bury their dead lavishly. The field has the history of the black people in the south as it buries their ancestors. He explains that the systems that facade to celebrate the life of the black people through statues or monuments with massive slave burial grounds. This was like taking one history and putting it on top of another until one day it pushes down so deep that no one can find it anymore. The emotional scene opens up to other witnesses in the courtroom testifying about the discriminatory acts of the Lowen group and their flawed contracts. The witnesses complain of being convinced to take on policies that force them to go back into the pocket, being recruited as a salesperson in their vulnerable moment, also paying upfront packages that do not end up helping them bury their loved ones, and overpricing products and services based on racial grounds. The following key witness, an ally of the corporation, confesses that the contract with the black church projected $1.2 billion, yet they had only given a $20,000 donation. These facts place O'Keefe on the winning side once again. The final blow is when Raymond Lowen is placed on cross-examination, which becomes interesting with Gary's humor. He profiles him as a big, busy man, a psychological trick he plays to show the CEO's position of power. Next, he asks him what type of boat he owns, its price, and the price of his plane. Unfortunately, he has no idea, a clear indication that he is unbothered about how much the vulnerable community suffers at the expense of his luxury. He continues to blunt out about the selfish, greedy nature of the corporation at a fast pace, string unrest among the defendant's lawyers, and utterly leading Raymond to confess that he was never bothered, a stance that provokes reactions from the jury. The defendants decided to open a settlement discussion. On the negotiating table, they make two offers, which are both rejected. As they exit the negotiation room, O'Keefe sings, Feels Good, which Gary joins in as a response to the claim that he has just passed on the one chance of getting $75 million to save his bankrupt business. Waiting for the verdict was the longest and most quiet moment for the two parties. Finally, the jury ruled in favor of the plaintiff, Jeremiah O'Keefe. They ruled that Jeremiah should be given $100 million for compensatory damages and $400 million for other damages. The film ends with detailed footnotes of the events of the real-life event of the fiction tales. The Lowen group appealed and agreed on a lesser settlement offer. Two years later, Ray Lowen was forced to resign as president and CEO of his company. Less than a year later, the company filed for bankruptcy. On the other hand, Jeremiah created a foundation to benefit the socially disadvantaged, including the black community. Willie Gary became even more prominent, acquiring the name The Giant Killer. Willie and Jerry's friendship triumphed until Jerry's passing in 2016. The film ends with the Gary character on the mass slave graveyard in a tribute. What a way to end a movie. The film shows that if Americans can come together irrespective of social or racial differences, they can kill the systems that use power to oppress the less disadvantaged.